The Mindful Way Through Depression Freeing Yourself from Chronic Unhappiness Depression hurts. It's the black dog of the night that robs you of joy, the unquiet mind that keeps you awake. It's a noonday demon that only you can see, the darkness visible only to you. If you've picked up this audio program, chances are you know these metaphors are no exaggeration. Anyone who's been visited by depression knows that it can cause debilitating anxiety, enormous personal dissatisfaction and an empty feeling of despair. It can leave you feeling hopeless, listless and worn down by the pervasive joylessness and disappointment associated with longing for a happiness never tasted. Any of us would do anything not to feel that way. Yet, ironically, nothing we do seems to help, at least not for long. For the sad fact of the matter is that once you've been depressed, it tends to return, even if you've been feeling better for months. If this has happened to you, or if you can't seem to find lasting happiness, you may end up feeling that you are not good enough, that you are a failure. Your thoughts may go round and round as you try to understand once and for all why you feel so bad. If you can't come up with a satisfactory answer, you might feel even more empty and desperate. Ultimately, you may become convinced that there is something fundamentally wrong with you. But what if there is nothing wrong with you at all? What if you are like virtually everybody else who suffers repeatedly from depression? You have become the victim of your own very sensible, even heroic, efforts to free yourself, like someone pulled even deeper into quicksand by the struggling intended to get you out. In this audio programme, we offer a series of practices that you can incorporate into your daily life to free you from the mental habits that keep you mired in unhappiness. This programme, known as Mindfulness-Based Cognitive Therapy, brings together the latest understandings of modern science and forms of meditation that have been shown to be clinically effective within mainstream medicine and psychology. The novel yet potent synthesis of these different ways of knowing the mind and the body can help you make a radical shift in your relationship to negative thoughts and feelings. Through this shift, you can find a way to break out of the downward spiral of mood so that it does not become depression. Our research has shown that the programme I'll be outlining for you can cut the risk of relapse by half in those who have had three or more episodes of depression. The women and men who took part in our studies had all suffered repeated bouts of clinical depression. But you don't have to have been officially diagnosed with depression to derive significant benefit from this programme. If you felt yourself repeatedly floundering in the quicksand of despair, inertia and sadness, our hope is that you will discover in this audio programme something of potentially enormous value that can help you free yourself from the downward pull of low mood and bring a robust and genuine happiness into your life. Exactly how you will experience the profoundly healthy shift in your relationship to negative moods and what will unfold for you in its aftermath are difficult to predict because they are different for everyone. The only way anyone can really know what benefits such an approach offers is to suspend judgment temporarily and engage in the process wholeheartedly over an extended period of time, in this case for eight weeks, and see what happens. This is exactly what we ask of the participants in our programmes. To deepen the process and make it more real, we have included a guided practice session that guides you carefully and with precision in the meditative practices described in this program. Along with the meditative practices, we will be encouraging you to experiment with cultivating attitudes of patience, compassion for yourself, open-mindedness and gentle persistence. These qualities can aid in freeing you from the gravitational pull of depression by reminding you in key ways of what science has now shown. It is actually okay to stop trying to solve the problem of feeling bad. In fact, it is wise, 
because our habitual ways of solving problems almost invariably wind up making things worse. As scientists and clinicians, we came to a new understanding of what is and what is not effective in dealing with repeated depression by a somewhat circuitous route. Until the early 1970s, scientists had concentrated on finding effective treatments for acute depression, for that devastating first episode often triggered by a catastrophic event in one's life. They found an effective treatment in the form of antidepressant medications, which remain enormously helpful in treating depression for many people. Then came the discovery that depression, once treated, often returns and becomes more and more likely to return the more often it is experienced. This changed our entire concept of depression and chronic unhappiness. It turned out that antidepressant medications fixed depression, but only as long as people kept taking them. When they stopped, depression came back for many people, even if not until months later. Neither patients nor doctors liked the idea of anyone taking lifelong medicine to keep the spectre of depression from the door. So, in the early 1990s, we, that's Zindel Siegel, John Teasdale and I, started exploring the possibility of developing an entirely new approach. First, we set to work to discover what keeps depression coming back. What is it that makes the quicksand more treacherous with every encounter? It turns out that every time a person gets depressed, the connections in the brain between mood, thoughts, the body and behaviour get stronger, making it easier for depression to be triggered again. Next, we started exploring what could be done about this ongoing risk. We knew that a psychological treatment called cognitive therapy had proven really effective for acute depression and protected many people against relapse, but no one knew for sure how it worked. We needed to find out. Until that time, all therapies, both antidepressant medication and cognitive therapy, were prescribed to people only once they were already depressed. We reasoned that if we could identify the critical ingredient in cognitive therapy, we might be able to teach those same skills to people when they were well. Rather than waiting for the catastrophe of the next episode to happen, we could, we hoped, train people to use these skills to nip it in the bud and prevent it from happening altogether. Curiously enough, our individual lines of research and inquiry ultimately led us to examine the clinical use of meditative practices oriented towards cultivating a particular form of awareness known as mindfulness, which originated in the wisdom traditions of Asia. These practices, which have been part of Buddhist culture for millennia, had been honed and refined for use in a modern medical setting by John Kabat-Zinn and his colleagues at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. Dr Kabat-Zinn had founded a stress reduction programme there in 1979, now known as MBSR, or Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction. MBSR is anchored in mindfulness meditation practices and their applications to stress, pain and chronic illness. MBSR has proved to be enormously empowering for patients with chronic diseases and debilitating conditions, as well as for psychological problems such as anxiety and panic. These benefits could be seen not only in changes in the way people felt, thought and behaved, but also in changes in the patterns of brain activity that we know underlie negative emotions. Despite some initial scepticism about what our colleagues and patients might say if we suggested we were considering meditation as a preventive approach to depression, we decided to take a closer look. We soon discovered that the combination of Western cognitive science and Eastern practices was just what is needed to break the cycle of recurrent depression. The mindfulness practices taught in this programme can help you let go both of past regrets and worries about the future and can prevent the normal unhappiness we all experience from spiralling down into depression. Mindfulness helps us get back in touch with the full range of our inner and outer resources for learning, growing and healing, resources we may not even believe we have. 
two words of caution before we go further. First, the various meditative practices that we describe often take some time to reveal their full potential. That is why they're called practices. They require revisiting, returning to them over and over again with a spirit of openness and curiosity rather than forcing some outcome that you feel is important to justify your investment of time and energy. This is really a new kind of learning for most of us, but one that is well worth experimenting with. Everything we cover here is meant to support you in your efforts. Second, it may be wise not to undertake the entire programme while in the midst of an episode of clinical depression. Current evidence suggests that it may be prudent to wait until you've gotten the necessary help in climbing out of the depths and are able to approach this new way of working with your thoughts and feelings with your mind and spirit unburdened by the crushing weight of acute depression. Whatever your starting point, we encourage you to practice the exercises and meditations described here with a combination of patience, self-compassion, persistence and open-mindedness. We invite you to let go of the tendency we all have to try to force things to be a certain way and instead work with allowing them to be as they actually already are in each moment. As best you can, simply trust in your fundamental capacity for learning, growing and healing as we go along through this process and engage in the practices as if your life depended on them which in many ways, literally and metaphorically, it surely does. The rest takes care of itself. Let's look first at why unhappiness won't let go. Let me give an example of how this works in real life. The first example is a woman named Alice. Alice tossed and turned. She couldn't sleep. It was three in the morning and she'd awakened with a jolt two hours earlier, her mind instantly buzzing with a rerun of the afternoon meeting with her supervisor. This time, though, there was a commentator. It was her own voice chiding her with shrill questions. Why did I have to put it that way? I sounded like an idiot. What did he mean by satisfactory? OK, but not nearly good enough for a raise. Kristen's department... What do they have to do with the project? That's my territory. At least for now. Is that what he meant by evaluating how things go? He's planning to put someone else in charge, isn't he? I knew my work wasn't good enough. Not for a raise, and maybe not even to keep my job. If only I'd seen it coming. Alice couldn't get back to sleep. By the time her alarm went off, her thoughts had moved on from the hopelessness of her position at work to the dire straits she and the children would be in once she was out looking for a job again. As she wrenched her aching body out of bed and struggled toward the bathroom, she was already picturing herself being rejected by one new prospective employer after another. Now let me share the experience of Jim. Jim hadn't any trouble sleeping. In fact, he just seemed to have a hard time being awake. There he was again, sitting in his car in the office parking lot, feeling the sheer weight of the day pinning him to his seat. His whole body felt leaden. It was all he could do just to unlatch his seatbelt. And still he sat, immobile, stuck, unable to grab the door handle and just go to work. Every appointment, every meeting, each phone call he had to return made him swallow what felt like an iron ball. And with each swallow, his mind wandered away from the day's agenda to the nagging question that seemed to be with him every morning. I've got everything most men could ask for. A loving wife, great kids, a secure job, a nice house. What's wrong with me? Why can't I pull myself together? And why is it always this way? Wendy and the kids are sick to death of my feeling sorry for myself. They're not going to be able to put up with me much longer. If only I could figure it out, things would be different. If I knew why I felt so rotten, I know I could solve the problem and just get on with life like everyone else. This is really stupid. Alice and Jim 
just want to be happy. Alice will tell you she's had good times in her life, but they never seem to last. Something sends her into a tailspin, and events she would have shaken off when younger now seem to plunge her into despair before she knows what's hit her. Jim says he's had good times too, but he tends to describe them as periods marked more by the absence of pain than by the presence of joy. He has no idea what makes the dull ache recede or return. All he knows is that he can't put his finger on the last time he spent an evening laughing and joking with family or friends. As visions of being unemployed swirl through Alice's head, a deep fear of being unable to do what she needs to do for herself and her kids lurks around the edges of her mind. Not again, she thinks with a sigh. She remembers well what happened when she'd found out that Bert had been cheating on her and she kicked him out of the house. Naturally, she'd felt sad and angry, but also humiliated by the way he'd treated her. He'd been unfaithful. Then she'd felt trapped, finding herself a single mother. Everyone was supportive, but there came a point when she thought that she should be over it by now. She thought she couldn't continue to ask for help from family and friends. Four months later, she found herself feeling more and more tearful and depressed, losing interest in the children's choir she directed, unable to concentrate at work, and feeling guilty about what a bad mother she was. She couldn't sleep, she was eating constantly, and eventually she went to her family physician, who diagnosed depression. Alice's doctor prescribed an antidepressant, which made a big improvement in her mood. Within a couple of months, she was back to her normal self. Until, nine months later, when the dark thoughts got louder, she called her doctor for another prescription, and soon she felt better again. This pattern repeated itself a few more times over the next five years. Every time she noticed the signs of being pulled down into the vortex again, she felt increasing dread. Alice wasn't sure she could take it any more. Jim had never been diagnosed with depression. He had never even talked to his doctor about his bleak frame of mind or his persistently low moods. He was surviving, and everything in his life was fine. What right did he have to complain about it to anyone? He would just sit there in his car until something came to him that would move him to open that door and get going. He tried thinking about his garden and all the beautiful new tulips that would be sprouting up soon. But that just reminded him that he hadn't really done the fall clean-up adequately and he'd have a lot to do to get the yard ready now, a thought that exhausted him. He thought about his kids and his wife. But the idea of trying to participate in dinner conversation that night just made him want to go to bed early, as he had last night. Alice has recurrent major depressive disorder. Jim may suffer from dysthymia, a sort of low-grade depression that is more a chronic state than an acute condition. The diagnosis doesn't matter that much. The problem for Alice and Jim, and many of the rest of us, is that we want desperately to be happy, but have no idea how to get there. For most of us, depression starts as a reaction to a tragedy or a reversal in life. The events that are particularly likely to produce depression are losses, humiliations and defeats that leave us feeling trapped by our circumstances. Alice became depressed following the loss of her long-term relationship with Bert. For Jim, the loss was a little more subtle and a lot less visible to the outside world. A few months after he received a promotion at his consulting firm, Jim found he no longer had time to spend with friends and had to drop out of his gardening club because he was staying later and later at the office. He also realised he didn't actually enjoy his new supervisory role. Eventually, he asked to return to a job similar to the one he had done before. The change was a relief, and no one knew Jim wasn't happy, not even Jim at first but he started second-guessing his decision, over-analysing every brief interaction with his bosses and ultimately chiding himself over and over for having failed his company and himself. Loss is an unavoidable part of the human condition, 
most of us find life an enormous struggle after the sort of crisis that Alice went through. And many of us feel diminished by disappointments in ourselves or others, as Jim did. But embedded in Alice's and Jim's stories are clues to why only some of us suffer lasting effects from such difficult experiences. Let's look now at why unhappiness turns into depression. Depression is a huge burden affecting millions today and at least 50% of those experiencing depression find that it comes back, despite the fact that they have appeared to make a full recovery. After a second or third episode, the risk of recurrence rises to between 80 and 90%. One of the most critical facts we have learned is that there is a difference between those of us who have experienced an episode of depression and those who have not. Depression forges a connection in the brain between sad mood and negative thoughts, so that even normal sadness can reawaken disturbing negative thoughts. This insight adds a new dimension to our understanding of how depression works. Decades ago, pioneering scientists like Aaron Beck had the insight that negative thoughts play a leading role in depression. Beck and his colleagues made a huge leap in our understanding of depression when they found that mood was strongly shaped by thoughts, that it wasn't necessarily events themselves that drive our emotions, but our beliefs about or interpretations of those events. Now we know there's even more to the story. Not only can thoughts affect mood, but in those of us who get depressed, mood can affect thoughts in ways that can then make an already low mood even lower. It doesn't require a traumatic loss for those of us who are vulnerable to plunge down into the spiral again. Even the kinds of everyday difficulties that many people shrug off can start the descent into depression or perpetuate unhappiness from day to day. Even more, as we'll see, this connection becomes so ingrained that sometimes the negative thoughts that lead to depression can be triggered by sadness so fleeting or minimal that the person experiencing it is hardly aware of it. No wonder so many of us feel we can't pull ourselves out of the abyss, no matter how hard we try. We have no idea where the descent began. Unfortunately, our valiant efforts to figure out how we got where we are turn out to be part of a complicated mechanism by which we get dragged down even farther. Disturbing emotions are an important part of life. They signal to us and to others that we are severely distressed, that something untoward has happened in our lives. But sadness can give way to depression when the sadness turns into endemically harsh, negative thoughts and feelings. This morass of negative thinking then generates its own tension, aches, pains, fatigue and turmoil. These, in turn, feed more negative thinking. The depression gets worse and worse, and with it, the hurt. We only compound our feelings of depletion if we deal with them by giving up activities that normally nourish us, like getting together with friends and family who might be a real support for us. Our exhaustion is compounded if we deal with it by simply working harder. It's not difficult to see how feelings, thoughts, physical sensations and behaviours are all part of depression. What's harder to see is how any one part of this anatomy of depression can trigger the downward spiral, and then how each component feeds into and reinforces the other. So let's look at each component in turn, the feelings, the thoughts, the body, and behaviour. First, feelings. If you think back to the last time you began to feel unhappy and describe your feelings, many different words might come to mind. Sad, blue, downhearted, miserable, despondent, low, feeling sorry for yourself. The strength of such feelings can vary, we can feel anywhere from slightly sad to extremely sad. It's normal for emotions to come and go, but it's rare for such depressive feelings to occur by themselves. 
They often cluster with anxiety and fear, anger and irritability, hopelessness and despair. Irritability is a particularly common symptom of depression. When down, we may feel impatient at the end of our rope with many of the people in our lives. We may be more prone than usual to angry outbursts. For some, especially young people, irritability is a more prominent experience than sadness in depression. The feelings by which we generally define depression are usually thought of as an end point. We're depressed. We feel sad, low, blue, miserable, despondent, desperate. But they're also a starting point. Research has shown that the more we've been depressed in the past, the more sad mood will also bring with it feelings of low self-esteem and self-blame. Not only do we feel sad, we may also feel like failures, useless, unlovable, losers. These feelings trigger powerful self-critical thoughts. We turn on ourselves, perhaps berating ourselves for the emotion we are experiencing. This is dumb, we may say. Why can't I just get over this and move on? And, of course, thinking this way just drags us down further. Such self-critical thoughts are extremely powerful and potentially toxic. Like our feelings, they can be both an end point and a starting point. So, now let's turn to this second aspect of depression, our thoughts. Take a moment or two to imagine the following scene as vividly as possible. Taking your time, note as best you can what goes through your mind. You are walking along a familiar street. You see someone you know on the other side of the street. You smile and wave. The person makes no response, just doesn't seem to notice you walks right past without any sign of recognising your existence. How does this make you feel? What thoughts or images go through your mind? You may think there are obvious answers to these questions, but what each of us feels depends critically on why we think the other person walked by us. This situation is ambiguous. If this scenario happens when we are in a good mood, the running commentary in our mind is likely to tell us that the person probably did not see us because he or she wasn't wearing glasses or was preoccupied. We might feel little or no emotional reaction at all. If we're feeling a bit down that day, on the other hand, our story, our self-talk, may tell us that the person deliberately ignored us, that we've lost another friend, and we may feel lonely and sad. And different interpretations of what has just happened can affect what happens next. With a benign interpretation, we may quickly forget the incident. With a negative one, we may be pitched into the kind of self-chiding that Alice did after her meeting with her boss. What have I done? What's wrong with me? Why don't I have more friends? Many situations are ambiguous, but the way we interpret them makes a huge difference in how we react. To complicate matters, our reactions then have an impact of their own. When we feel low, we're likely to pick out and elaborate on the most negative interpretation. Once we've seen someone pass us in the street, and our low mood has brought to mind the interpretation that he or she deliberately ignored me, this only makes us feel even lower. In turn, the increasingly deteriorating mood leads to questions about why this person snubbed me, which only marshals more evidence to support our case of our own unlikability. We may think, this happened to me just last week with so-and-so. I don't think anyone likes me. I just can't make lasting relationships. What's wrong with me? The stream of thoughts begins to settle on a theme of worthlessness, isolation and inadequacy. If you're familiar with this kind of thought stream, it may be helpful to know that you're not alone in this pattern of negative thinking. If we're feeling OK at the moment, we might see quite clearly that these thoughts are distortions. But when we're depressed, they can seem like the absolute truth. 
The fact that we often take these toxic and distorted thoughts about ourselves as unassailable truth only cements the connection between sad feelings and self-critical thought streams. Knowing this is vitally important to understanding why depression takes hold in some people and not in others, or on some occasions and not on others. Unhappiness itself is not the problem. It is an inherent and unavoidable part of being alive. Rather, it's the harshly negative views of ourselves that can be switched on by unhappy moods that entangle us. It is these views that transform passing sadness into persistent unhappiness and depression. Once these harsh, negative views of ourselves are activated, not only do they affect our mind, they also have profound effects on our body. And then the body, in turn, has profound effects on the mind and emotions. So let's look now at how our moods can affect our bodies. Depression rapidly leads to dysregulation of our eating habits, sleep and energy levels. We might not feel like eating, which can eventually result in severe and unhealthy weight loss. Or we might overeat, gaining inordinate amounts of weight. Our sleep cycles can be disrupted in either direction too. Either we feel low energy most of the time and sleep too much, or we find it difficult to get enough sleep. We may find ourselves waking in the middle of the night or early in the morning and being unable to get back to sleep. As in Alice's case, we churn over and over the events of our lives and the inadequacy of our response to them. 80% of those who suffer from depression consult their physician because of aches and pains in the body they cannot explain. Much of this is linked to the tiredness and fatigue that come with depression. In general, when we encounter something negative, the body tends to tense up. Our evolutionary history has bequeathed us a body that will prepare for action when it perceives a threat in the environment, such as a tiger that we need to avoid or escape from. Our heart rate speeds up, and blood is shifted away from the surface of the skin and the digestive tract to the large muscles of the extremities, which tense up in readiness to fight or flee or freeze. However, the most ancient parts of the brain make no distinction between the external threat of a tiger and internal threats such as worries about the future or memories from the past. When a negative thought or image arises in the mind, there will be a sense of contraction, tightening or bracing in the body somewhere. It may be a frown, a stomach churning, a pallor in the skin or a tension in the lower back, all part of a preparation to freeze, fight or run. Once the body reacts in this way to negative thoughts and images, it feeds back to the mind the information that we are threatened or upset. Research has shown that the state of our bodies affects the state of our minds without our having any awareness of it. In one study, psychologists asked people to watch cartoons and then rate how funny they were. Some of the people had to do this while holding a pencil between their teeth so that they inadvertently tightened up the muscles used in smiling. Others had to hold a pencil between pursed lips, which kept them from smiling. Those who watched using their smiling muscles rated the cartoons as funnier. What does the experiment tell us? When we're unhappy, the effect of that mood on our body can bias the way we evaluate and interpret things around us without our being even the slightest bit aware that this is happening. It's not just that patterns of negative thinking can affect our moods and our bodies. Feedback loops in the other direction, from the body to the mind, also play a critical role in the persistent return and deepening of unhappiness and dissatisfaction. The close links between the body and emotion mean that our bodies function as highly sensitive emotion detectors. They are giving us moment-to-moment -moment readouts of our emotional state. Of course, most of us aren't paying attention. We're too busy thinking. 
many of us have been brought up to ignore the body in the interest of achieving whatever goals we are striving to attain. In fact, if we struggle with depression, we may feel a strong aversion to any signals that our body may be putting out. Those signals may be of a constant state of tension, exhaustion and chaos in the body. We would prefer to have nothing to do with it in the hope that this interior turbulence will subside on its own. Naturally, not wanting to deal with the aches, pains and frowns means more avoidance and therefore more unconscious contraction in the body and the mind. Gradually we slow down and are less and less able to function. Depression has started to affect the fourth aspect of our lives, our behaviour. Let's see how it does so. As children or young adults, we may have been counselled by well-meaning people to soldier on or just get over it when we were feeling particularly downhearted or miserable. Perhaps somewhere along the way, we picked up the message that it was shameful or weak to show our emotions. We naturally assumed that people would think the worst of us if they knew we were depressed. The thinking that accompanies depression, with its core themes of inadequacy and unworthiness, is infinitely transportable to any situation. Without even knowing it, we can become stuck in believing with great certainty that virtually any stress or difficulty we experience is our fault and that it is our responsibility to sort it out for ourselves. And when working harder doesn't solve anything, that's our fault too. The result is terminal exhaustion. Depression makes us behave differently, and our behaviour can also feed depression. If we're convinced we're no good or unworthy, how likely are we to pursue the things that we value in life? And when we make choices informed by a depressive state of mind, they're more than likely to keep us stuck in our unhappiness. A fleeting thought of failure can trigger a huge sense of fatigue. A small comment by a family member can trigger an avalanche of emotions such as guilt and regret, feeding a sense of inadequacy. Because these downward spirals are so easily triggered by small events or mood shifts, they feel as if they come out of nowhere. And once depression takes hold, all our attempts to control our thoughts or to snap out of our feelings are to no avail. What can we do to prevent the normal and understandable emotion of unhappiness from persisting or spiralling down into depression? our first challenge will be to understand why it is that we feel so powerless to change how we are feeling, and why, despite valiant efforts to assert control, we are continually getting ourselves more and more stuck.